Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, welcome to the uh, third annual American Dream Reconsidered Conference. Uh, we are very excited to introduce you to our panel tonight. Uh, I'd first like to ask you if you could please um, silence or smother your cell phones or whatever you need to do so that they don't make noise during the presentation. That would be awesome. Um, so we have a, a very distinguished panel for you tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator and then turn it over to her. Um, we're really thrilled to have our very own Dr. Heather Delmage tonight, uh, professor of sociology and director of the Mansfield Institute for Social Justice and Transformation. Uh, she's also the president-elect of the Society for the Study of Social Problems. Uh, she serves on the Board of Education for the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice, and she has published very broadly in the areas of race, juvenile justice, disability, family, and education. Uh, Dr. Downledge is a former Fulbright Scholar to South Africa uh, and serves on several editorial boards. And she's the 2018 recipient of the Doris Wilkinson Faculty Leadership Award for her scholar activism. And I can tell you she's one of our uh, most treasured faculty and we're so thrilled that she's gonna be moderating this panel tonight. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Heather um, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Great. So hello, everybody. Can you hear me OK? All right. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. It's a, just a beautiful day in Chicago, and I'm happy to be here with you all. I'd like to start by introducing our panel and then um, giving you some information about what we're going to be talking about tonight, and then we'll get into the discussion. Uh, we'll be talking for about an hour together, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A. So if you have questions, you've got your pens, write them down. We'll have mics on both sides when we're done. Comments? I'm, yeah, comments and questions. If your comments get long, though, I might stop you. Um, so first, let me introduce uh, Jamel Bowie to my left. He's based in Charlottesville, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. He's the chief political correspondent for Slate Magazine and a political analyst for CBS News. He covers campaigns, elections, national affairs, and before, um, before being at Slate, he was a staff writer for the Daily Beast and had held fellowships at the American Prospect and at the Nation magazine. He attended the University of Virginia, where he has degrees in government and religious studies. And he's also a wonderful, I say, wonderful photographer and um, documents his surroundings on film. Next to. <laughs> okay. To the left of Mr. Bowie is Natalie Moore from Chicago. Um, she's the WBEZ Southside reporter. She covers topics of segregation, inequality, housing, economic development, food injustice, and violence. She's the author of Southside, a portrait of Chicago and American segregation. And she's also written other books, but I'm gonna skip to a few of her awards. Um, she was the winner of the 2016 Chicago Review of Books Award for nonfiction. She is the 2017 recipient of the Chicago Library Foundation 21st Century Award, and she is the 20, in 2010, she received the Studs Terkel Community Media Award. Um, so please welcome Natalie Moore. And then to the left of Ms. Moore is Deputy Chief Elgin Holt, um, a Roosevelt alum. He gets an extra clapping. Hey. We were trying to figure out, he graduated in 97 and I started here in 96, so we were just playing the game of did we pass in the hallways. Um, so um, Deputy Chief Holt began with the Chicago Police Department in 1985. He's held many positions throughout his career, uh, beginning as a field training officer, and then he's been through quite a few supervisory roles. Yeah. Uh, he's done tactical, and he was a tactical gang sergeant, tactical lieutenant, detective in the detective division, a lieutenant and commander of the area south saturation. Saturation gun and saturation. Oh, gun. saturation slash gun and gang enforcement teams. Yeah. I needed to read one more. I thought I had a typo. Um, so please join me in welcoming Deputy <laughs> Chief L.D. Holtz. OK, 
Okay, so we're here tonight to talk about uh, policing and incarceration and reform. So what I want to do is start out by painting a picture of where we are. So currently, over 2 million, 2.2 million adults are incarcerated. 4.7 million are on probation or parole, adults. But those numbers don't obviously tell the full picture. That when we break it down by race, we can see who bears the brunt of a society engaged in mass incarceration. Um, for white folks, out of 100,000, 450 are going to be incarcerated, according to current numbers. Um, out of 100,000, 831 Latinos. And out of 100,000, 2,306 2, black Americans will be incarcerated. And we start the process in this country of controlling and containing and incarceration very early. Every night, 60,000 youth in our country sleep in jail or prison. And these are kids under 18 years old. Out of 100,000 children, 152 are incarcerated. White youth are, have a placement rate of 86 per, per 100,000. Black youth, 433 per 100,000. Race and class matters. We also know that at the intersection of race, class, that when we add disability and mental health issues, we account for almost 100% of the children that we incarcerate in this country. Um, so what I'd like to do now that I've set up all, the, all of this, now I can turn it over to the, the panelists. Um, what I want to start out with is asking you all to just talk a little bit, how did we get to this point where we are incarcerating so many of our citizens um, and incarcerating with these racial disparities? How did we get here? And why don't we start out, yeah, with Mr. Bowie. Uh, <coughs> First, thank you everyone uh, for coming out. Thank you for moderating. Uh, thank you for Roosevelt for, for hosting this. Um, you know, the, the question of how we got here is like an entire academic discipline. Um, and so I guess I'll try to tell this story in as kind of truncated a manner as I can. Um, and, and the short answer is that sort of two things happened in the middle of the century. So the, the first thing it's, it's worth saying is that the United States has always sort of had an elevated incarceration rate relative to most other uh, most other countries, um, but it saw the, the beginnings of what we call mass incarceration really begin in the late 60s, early 70s, sort of rapid increases in the number of incarcerated people. And you can say two things happened. The first is that there was actually an increase in crime. That did happen. Um, uh, for reasons that I'm not sure criminologists are entirely certain of, it, it's still an active debate as to why crime <laughs> went up and then in the last 20 years um, have a precipitous drop. That's still a little hazy, but it happened and um, uh, one response to it was to just lock up more people, to have tougher punishments, longer sentences, that sort of thing. The other thing that happened uh, is sort of the collapse of the uh, uh, sort of industrial base, um, deindustrialization in the Midwest and the, the Mid-Atlantic um, kind of the collapse of working class communities, um, both white and of color. And those, th th those two things happening in tandem with each other prompted a policy response and, and sort of a third thing happening in the culture is sort of a turn towards punitiveness, um, a belief that there is sort of a problem of lawlessness in American life and, and that the solution is more punitive solution, is, is more punitive actions. And so you, you, you throw these things together, and what, what's, what's, what's driving mass incarceration um, on a, a macro level is the state looking at economic dislocation, looking at crime, and saying that the solution to these things is just to lock people up, um, uh, to put people in jail. Uh, and as the problems get worse, um, the momentum towards those solutions uh, continues to build, and there's, a, there's a, a whole story here about sort of 
the actors who are responsible for this. Some of this is happening at the federal level, some of this is, uh, most of it's happening at the state and local level. Um, uh, decisions made by countless people in countless different uh, situations that are kind of all moving in the single direction. Um, it's worth a bracket here to say that global, at least in, in sort of Western countries, other Western countries also saw an increase in incarceration. Um, it's just here in the United States, it was a massive increase, far and above what we saw, uh, what you see in the rest of the world. And, and that, I think, goes towards, um, is, it, is explained both by our particular history um, and the extent to which we, we hit these trends of, of uh, deindustrialization, of um, uh, growing crime, with a threadbare safety net, with a sort of a state that from the outset wasn't prepared to deal with them. And so um, taken together, you have, I mean, you have the conditions mm -hmm. for mass incarceration. Um, and it, it kind of, I mean, it just, it just sort of gets worse. It becomes its own sort of self-perpetuating machine um, in which uh, punitive measures look like the best solution to the problem because they've been the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. um, Natalie Moore, I know your, your book on Southside actually looks at these longstanding problems and segregation. And I'm wondering, you know, in light of, of what Mr. Bowie is talking about, if you could talk a little bit about that, that history of segregation and how that's led into where we are now. Sure. So housing segregation is in everything in this country. And if we just look at Chicago, um, you know, no one wants to say segregation. They think that it's something of the past. Well, redlining is over, kind of. Um, or racially restrictive covenants are over. Contract buying is over, and it's really not. But so those 20th century policies still have a lingering effect. And there isn't this acknowledgement that this is, you know, our expressways were built to, you know, really give the red carpet for white flight. Suburbs were built because they were for whites only, the FHA loans. And so you had this outward migration, and then you had um, your core cities that were cr crumbling, and then you had policies like where, exp where expressways in the city were built, where public housing is. Um, and these fights are still happening today, affordable housing. People think that affordable, no one knows the difference between affordable housing versus Section 8 versus public housing. It just all means poor black people or brown people are coming to ruin your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there's a history of suburbs keeping housing out, I'm gonna use Deerfield, suburban Deerfield as an example, median salary, uh, household income um, over 100,000, 97% white. They kept blacks out in the 60s. I did a story a few years ago, a church wanted to use their land to build some affordable housing, you know, just so like people who work in the town could, could live there. And some of the comments from people there were, we don't want those Chicago people coming, putting their cars on cinder blocks. I've never seen cars on cinder blocks in Chicago, by the way. And I live here. Um, so there, there are these, you know, cold words and keeping, you know, there's, there's a fight right now in Jefferson, Jefferson Park by O'Hare, a white neighborhood. They don't want affordable housing. Um, and we do have some, uh, elected officials are not there yet, but we do have some groups, Metropolitan Planning Council, other journalists, the Chicago Urban League, who are using the S word and saying this isn't just part of our path, past, and also putting a roadmap of things that can be done, like aldermanic prerogative. Mr. or Ms. Alderman, if you have less than 10% housing that's affordable in your ward, you just can't flat out say, say no. So we still have all these housing issues, a ton of missed opportunities to integrate public schools, you know, the boundaries, closing schools are built, white annexes on white schools are built, and there's a nearby black or Latino school that could have been merged. So it's not just the past. There are these things that are still happening today. But I also want to talk a little bit, um, and this is 
jumping off the things that Jamel said, the war on drugs has to be talked about too when we look at how do we get to where we are. My second book is about the Blackstone Rangers, um, a street gang here in Chicago. And when you look at what Richard Nixon decided to do, you know, the war on drugs started with him and then Reagan amplified it. But there are these dog whistles and code words, law and order, the assumption that only black people commit crimes, cities, you know, cities get racialized, right? You know, it, Chicago was not, uh, believe it or not, wasn't the only city that was talked about as murder capital. We had to go through Gary, we went through Washington, D.C. This has mm -hmm. been iterations. It's right. just that Chicago is in the limelight right now for it. And so with Nixon, you know, that's when we started seeing these, these numbers. And then Reagan, you know, I'm of the just say no generation with Nancy Reagan. But we also saw that um, RICO laws were expanded right. in the 80s. And so the, the, those were laws to take down the mob. And then they were used to try to bring down street organizations, um, including the Blackstones, which then were the, the El Rukins in Chicago. Um, I'm sure you were around that during that time. I'm sure you have some, some things to add with that. But um, when you look at the federal resources that were put in to taking down some of these organizations. So, you know, the, the big thing with the El Rukins was that they were actually the first Americans convicted of domestic terrorism in this country for um, supposedly buying a rocket from Gaddafi. I remember that. And that set the stage for our post 9-11 world with the, the guys in Liberty City, Miami. Um, and the feds will keep going after you. You can, you know, it can be a mistrial, it could be a not, it, it, if it's not a, a guilty verdict, they can keep coming back to you. So the war on drugs has played a, a big part in this as well. Mm -hmm, for sure. And, and um, Deputy Chief Holt, so um, you've actually been on on the ground since 1985, and you yes, know, we I saw have. some of the more dramatic shifts. You know, when Reagan reached across and shook hands with Thatcher, and sort of our economy began in earnest to shift. Um, and I'm just wondering if if you can talk about, you know, how do you see what's what's happened? Where how did we get here? Well, as you said, when we go back and we look at the history of, it, and we talk about the war on drugs, and the um, and the impact of that and the outgrowth of that. Uh, like you say, I came on in 1985 here in Chicago as a young officer. I worked TAC in the gang units. But in 1988 was the explosion of crack into Chicago. Mm -hmm. I can remember at that time uh, we've been told to when it does hit, it's coming. It was coming from the West Coast. And what happened when it did get here, we were into powder cocaine, but when the crack came, the crack was a little bit more addictive. And also what the crack did, it created uh, an economic boom, so to speak, for, if you want to say lower class, but those who were contained in like the projects, it was an economic base for them to um, uh, uh, growth uh, money to bring uh, the, that type of capital to them. But what happened when the growth of that, it required us to, it was an outcry from the community to the police. Well, now the growth of uh, crack cocaine, it created an economic base for the gangs. The gangs exploded. They began to grow again. There was a time where in the 60s it, it tapered off. Even in the 70s it tapered off with the arrest of Jeff Ford, with the arrest of Hoover and those type of individuals. It tapered off real tough. but. When the crack cocaine exploded, the, the gangs exploded again. They came growth, they got stronger, they economically got stronger. They developed their turf and their, their, their growth. But in the project in, in particular, and when we talk about containment and growth, it, it was a breeding ground for that. And like I said, it was, a, it was a economic base. You saw the young African Americans again, uh, they, the impact of that on them was, was more severe because they were the ones being arrested for this. They were not the ones bringing it into Chicago, but they were the ones being arrested for this. But there was a cry, what can the police do? And it was all about what the police could do, what the police could do. And our, and our, 
Our response to that at that time, of course, was to make arrests. And what we did, there was a lot of low-level arrests, but there were a lot of big-time arrests, with some with our, our federal partners. Now, the economic growth, again, like I said, it, it grew. And our growth of that into the 80s and even into the 90s. When we got into the 90s, the drug academic just it exploded, the gang exploded. The violence exploded because there was turf wars, there was uh, retaliation. So during the early 90s, what a lot of people don't know, that we almost went up to 1,000 homicides as a result of that in the early 90s. But as a result, within Chicago, we had strategies. This was homegrown strategies. By the end of the, in the late 99, we had got our homicide rates down to up under uh, 400, even into the 300. So we were doing something, but during that time, there was the growth of more uh, interaction with the community, with community-based organizations, with reaching out to the community a little bit more. And that's what we did then. And even into the, um, coming into the 2000s again, and again, when they did um, bring the projects down, the outgrowth of that was, was just those individuals going into the various communities now and, 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 and then establishing their turf again. And then still continue to um, deal with the drug component of it. And what we have today is a result of that, that growth and that, that war on drugs, as they said but the expansion and the growth of that uh, crack coming here. Like you say, the people who were bringing it here, that was the federal, that was their responsibility to try to you know, cut that off here. Mm -hmm. But even today, like I said, what we have now is still the outgrowth of the violence that we have now, it's still the outgrowth of that drug epidemic back in the, in the 80s and up to this point. Um, we're making great strides now you know, in what we're doing, our, 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 we, we're getting our homicide rates now, but we're also uh, more involved in the community again. We're also uh, more involved with the community-based organizations again, and what have you. Um, we still have the situations where there's still gang turf, there's still violence as a result of gang turf, but it's, when they cut off the heads of the, the older organization, the, the gangs, they broke off into many different fashions. And as a result of those many different fashions, you have internal wars now. Mm -hmm. And what we have now also is, is innocent people getting caught in the valley uh, of these uh, particular gang wars. But like I said, it was as a result of, of the drug, uh, the war on drugs, the, the drug academic, the economics of it also. So this is where we're at today. But like I said, we're, we're as a police department, have reached back and just reestablishing our community policing Bureau, but just reaching out to the community again, and and um, we we're striving. We're striving. Can I add a couple of things Please. to um, Deputy Chief's timeline? So crack came later to Chicago compared to the West Coast and the East Coast, and yes, it some people attribute that to the El Rukans, who at the time were selling synthetic heroin, mm -hmm. um, and we're like, no, we don't know what this is. We don't really want yeah. crack coming coming in. Mm -hmm. um, we've got our we've got our own thing. Um, at that point, Jeff Ford, who was the leader, was in was in prison, as was Larry Hoover, mm -hmm. who was um, Gangster Disciples. I was a teenager in the early '90s, and like right now, like the corner boy uniform is white tees and and. Um, Jeans, right. um, when I was coming up, it was much more color-coded. Mm -hmm. Red and blue, like that, that, that navigated where you could go or where you couldn't go, like, and, and it was much more turf-based, sure. whereas now it's more block by block. Block, by block. And these guys now could not tell you who Larry Hoover is or Jeff Ford, even if they claim the name. Right. Um, and so then, this sounds completely cliche, but then it became like season three of The Wire. So the high rises come really? down and you have a bunch of displaced drug dealers. I first met Superintendent Eddie Johnson, interviewed him when he was a commander in the 6th District. Um, he wanted me to do a ride along with him, but CPD would not uh, approve it. And you know, there are, the, the plan for transformation really quickly, that was tearing down of all the high rise public housing. And you had, um, there's, that's a whole nother academic conversation yes. about um, 
the effectiveness and the disaster of it. Yeah. But really what happened is that people moved from vertical segregation in the high rises to being put on Section 8 vouchers and moving out into neighborhoods. So one myth is that crime went up in neighborhoods because of former project people. No, crime was going down. So neighborhoods that had a higher influx did not see a greater decrease in crime, but it wasn't, and there are also rumors, they all flooded the south suburbs. The numbers don't show that either. Um, so I remember what Eddie Johnson told me at the time was, so these neighborhoods, these, these communities, Robert Taylor, Stateway, um, Ida B. Wells, were neglected communities. You could be a drug dealer and not live in that community, and you knew that you could do what you wanted to do in, in those places. So um, what, what he told me at the time was, if you look at people's arrest records, you will see a pattern that they were drug dealers in these other places. That does not mean that they were residents. They could have had a relative, they might not have, but you had, I remember when the Dearborn homes, maybe 10 years ago, people were dying from synth, another form of synthetic heroin with formaldehyde on top. And I remember CPD, the spokesperson at the time said, we're gonna stop telling journalists where these overdoses are happening because people are reading you and it's a roadmap for them to go die. So you had all this like disconnected drug dealing going on in places and then if you're displaced and you go to a corner that's all, a neighborhood that's already set up, then you're having conflict that was there. Um, but I, I do wanna say one thing that I, that I disagree with you on when you said that crack was more addictive. It was not crack, it's cocaine. And that basis that crack was more addictive, that was the basis of federal laws to have the disparities between crack and cocaine. What we know is that people who use crack had a lot of other issues like mental health or joblessness. And so maybe the effect seems stronger because you're dealing with poor people with a host of other issues, but I would say this, Crack though, and cocaine, I mean, it's one's powdered and one is cooked. But I would say this, crack became the drug of choice for lower class people who could not afford uh, powder cocaine. And it, yes. was very, it was very widespread and it was very addictive. It, still, it was very addictive. But it's so. not more addictive than cocaine. Like, all the research shows scientifically it's not. It's like, it's, it's the same substance. I understand that, but the impact of it, when I was working the streets, the impact of it, was greater in the lower communities, in these communities. The impact was much greater than powder cocaine. And when I worked and I saw the transition from cocaine to crack, and believe me, it went from powder to crack, and that was just it, crack. It wasn't powder anymore. And when they didn't use powder no but, more but, like that. But I'm saying that there, you already have a host of issues happening oh, in yeah, these communities. Enough. And true white enough. people in white communities hide drug addiction. We did a whole series on heroin a few years ago. Um, and this is before we started talking about the opiate crisis the way that we do now. We, there's a, and this rumor I believe is true, there was a, I mean, the, the suburban use of heroin is, with young people, is so strong, mm -hmm. and teenagers. Police officers do not arrest them the same way that we see in Chicago. And the other thing, and th there was a, um, a rumor, and, and because you can hide things there, of a, a high schooler in one of these western suburbs dying in a classroom from a heroin overdose. Can you imagine the national and international media that would have come to Chicago if a CPS kid had overdosed in a classroom? Stuff is hidden in the suburbs. And the impact is there, but when you have money and you have resources and you're protecting whiteness, it doesn't come off the same way. So um, this might be. <laughs> this might be actually a good place to move to the the next discussion, and that is that the, the the question of sentencing and sentencing disparities and over policing and under policing in in different racially raci racially different neighborhoods. Um, what it meant was we saw this massive increase in the number of blacks who were being incarcerated, even when we know that statistically whites are using drugs at a higher rate and, and all of that. 
Um, and so some of these disparities became so glaring that in the 2000s, there was a demand for reducing incarceration. And many of the discussions that were happening early on around we need reform were based on arguments that it could reduce state budgets if we did not incarcerate so many people. Um, and so um, I, I just want to say a couple more words, and then I want to turn it over to you all to discuss this, this approach to reform that happened. Um, and so many of those discussions were about reducing state budgets, but as those budgets were being reduced, the money wasn't going back into the neighborhoods where children really needed those resources, right? Um, we do have uh, this wonderful website called Million Dollar Blocks, if any of you are interested in looking it up. Um, these folks did the analysis of where we're, we're putting our money for incarceration and policing, and you'll see that the poorest blocks in Chicago uh, mirror the most spending for incarceration and policing. Um, and so we have blocks where we're putting millions of dollars in, but it's on the policing incarceration end. So the reforms were calling for a reduction in this budget, but there wasn't a whole lot of discussion around humanity or the context, as you're pointing out, the context of injustice, um, or what was going on in the streets for the kids that were caught up, the innocent folks that were caught up, or even the folks that we might not consider innocent, they're still caught up in a system that's so unjust. So I'm just wondering if you all could just speak to the reform efforts um, to this point as, as you've seen them. And then where I'd like to go is, um, can we reform our way out of where we are? Yeah. Is that possible? I mean, the, the interesting thing about the reform efforts is that you know, reducing mandatory minimums, um, reducing uh, you know, sentences for possession crimes, all those sorts of things aren't these. These aren't these aren't these aren't bad things. They certainly make an impact on um, on sort of the, the the level of incarceration. But they don't they don't really get at the root of the problem. And this and Natalie at the beginning um, mentioned or talked about segregation. And, and I think segregation really is at the heart of the story. That you have um, what are essentially like pariah classes of people. People who've been declared by society to sort of like not be worth the full investment of society and they are segregated away, they're literally segregated away. Um, and because they are kind of classified as, as a pariah class, they, um, they, they get more contact with sort of the, the, the official face of state violence. They are more likely to be policed. Um, they are more likely to see contact with law enforcement. They're more likely to, the resources that go towards them are not resources of healthcare, medical care, et cetera. They're um, resources of, of the state apparatus of violence. And mere reform doesn't really touch that. Um, uh, you can, uh, stop and frisk in New York is a good example of this. You can end stop and frisk, which is what happened in New York, but you're still left with a situation where black and brown New Yorkers are much more likely to receive police contact, not because black and brown New Yorkers are more likely to carry weapons or more likely to carry drugs, but because those communities um, are, are sort of understood wrongly, but that's they're sort of understood as being vectors of crime, vectors of disorder that sort of need to be patrolled, need to be controlled. Um, and to in that requires like a fundamental rethinking of what, what, what we're tr like, not just what policing is trying to do, but a fundamental rethinking of what we are as a society trying to do. Are we going to actually have pariah classes of people? Um, and as long as we say yes, and so far we continue to say yes, yeah. then these things will just flow naturally from them. Um, one of the, you know, one of the. There's a great book um, by a LA Times reporter um, named Jill uh, Leovi, Leovi, I've never met her in person, so I've never gotten a correct pronunciation of her last name. But she has a great book, it's called Ghetto Side. Um, it's about uh, South Central LA. And it's, it's sort of about um, uh, crime and, and sort of homicide in South Central LA and sort of the things that produce areas of, produce high homicide rates. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, most startling things I, in the book, um, and the thing that kind of blew my mind as a reader, was she notes how there's there's certain combinations of factors that 
wherever you see them, not just in the United States, but globally, produce the kinds of conditions you might see um, in, a, in, in segregated high crime areas. So economic isolation, um, uh, segregation, a sense that these people are pariahs, um, sort of a, a relationship to the law that is um, uh, this combination of being over-policed on, on minor infractions, but under-policed on major, on major issues. So um, uh, people are, are harassed for uh, being on the street, but murders don't get solved. And when you, when you, when you have all these things together, wherever, regardless of the kind of the superficial cultural context, you, you get um, the kinds of dynamics that she depicted in South Central LA. And that to me, um, that to me is a sign that it, it's not clear you can simply reform your way out of um, the problems of mass incarceration, the, 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 the problems of sort of um, uh, overly punitive uh, criminal justice because they're all rooted in kind of very elemental things happening in our society. Um, that you just have to decide you you have you have to want to change those. Um, you have to do you know what what Marx is call like non non reformist reforms, like fundamental changes to the structure of things, if you want to to really make an impact. Hmm. Are either of you interested in? Well, I just want to since you mentioned million dollar blocks, I actually printed out info so I could read. Oh, terrific. <laughs> um, <laughs> So in 2015, the Illinois Department of Corrections committed $1.4 billion despite declining crime levels. The community areas with the highest spending on incarceration from 2005 to 2009 are the following. Austin, 550 million. Humboldt Park, 293 million. West Inglewood, 170, 197 million. North Lawndale, 241 million. And Roseland, 159 million. And so what do those neighborhoods have in common? Segregation. With the exception of maybe of Humboldt Park, which is experiencing gentrification. Um, but these, I mean, all of these, everything goes, goes back to this. Um, Several years ago, I did a story about the zip codes with the highest numbers of parolees. So in 2012, 2,400 parolees went to these four zip codes, 60651, 60644, 60624, 60612. Those are all west side zip codes. So there's a pattern, there's a link that's here. And so when you have Returning citizens coming to neighborhoods where you already have unemployment, you already have high poverty, you already have high negative health outcomes. Segregation isn't about, you know, holding hands and singing kumbaya with your white neighbor. It's about resources and proximity to power. Mm -hmm. And because yes, I mean there there are plenty of places in Africa like black people can live around each other and be fine. But our structure of segregation in this country, um, the pariah status, not giving resources to neighborhoods. Um, and segregation affects, this isn't just a low income issue. You can be a black person earning $100,000 in a black neighborhood and maybe you just got a grocery store recently mm -hmm. or you don't have one or you don't have, you're still dealing with these, these same, to a different degree, but these issues um, cut across cut across class lines. Yeah, you know, and I'm wondering if if you wouldn't mind. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you wouldn't mind talking about what that experience is to be in the neighborhoods, because as these reforms are put in place, people are being sent back to neighborhoods, and the neighborhoods don't have resources. But I heard you saying that you all are getting more involved in community-based organizations, and so. Um, from your perspective, how, how have you seen these reforms playing out in the neighborhoods and relative to the work that you're well, doing? Well, as far as the reforms in the neighborhoods, again, like you say, we, we do deal with community-based organizations. We do deal with uh, our community policing. 
uh, one such community-based organization that, that we, we have dealt with over the years is uh, the community of St. Sabina and what have you and the things that Father Flager had did over there and his outreach to the, uh, to the gangs in the neighborhoods, bringing them in to, to uh, uh, communicate with police and other entities there. There was a point at one time, when I worked in the 6th District too, up under the superintendent at the time when he was a command, I was a tax sergeant over there. And with Father Flager, one thing that was working when he was bringing them together, when we would talk and communicate, but when things would go down, they would communicate to him, he would communicate to us. Uh, if, if something was gonna go down, there's a fight or, or there's some retaliation, he would get in there and intervene, and then they would come and talk to us, and we built a, a good relationship. Uh, over, over the, over the uh, years, I would say, because maybe uh, due to some economics that wasn't coming back into those particular organizations, which come from government entities, which, which individuals should be, uh, have a bigger outcry, of, of, such as the, the governor, when he cut the social programs that were going into these communities, and it, was, it really made an impact. Yeah. The money wasn't there no more. The gangs and, and those members who were gravitating, who were reaching out, you know, now there's no money to help them, to, to move them along the way. And that was a major impact with Governor Round and what he did. That was, that was a negative impact of what he did. So when we talk about reform, reform, you got to reform the government also. That's where the tax money goes, that's where the tax money is coming from. It goes back into the community, which it should. It should go back in the community that I have served o over these years, hundreds of uh, many communities. I've worked in the black communities all my career, all my life, and had to deal with the gangs, the guns, and the drugs in those communities. We talk about reforms again. We talk about the gun issue. We talk about gun legislation, common sense gun legislation. We're talking about holding those shooters accountable, which they're not doing. So we're talking about reforms again. We're talking about people not maybe going to their legislator, pushing them, making them do it, making them step up to the table, making them do their job and what they're getting paid to do. It, what it tends to happen, it falls on the police, and when we come in, sometimes we come in from an enforcement part of it, which we have to sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we have to come in at that sometime, and then you start talking about the mass uh, the incarceration, yes, there's the incarceration part of it that we do, and we have no choice sometimes to come in it from that, that perspective. Now we start talking about reform, what we are up under now in Chicago is a consent decree. That's a reform, it's on us. We have no choice. We have to abide by it. We have to abide by those criteria that are within it. And there's that be so, it's no, and we're going through those reforms now. We're, we're getting better training. We have to deal with the use of force now. So when we start talking about reform, reform, it depends on what you want to reform and who's going to reform it and how you're going to get them to reform it. So th that's wh where we're at. And, and like I said, we're, I'm still out and about, but I'm at a, a, a little bit different level now, an administrative level within the police department. But there are things that are still going on, but there are some good things that are going on in certain communities that are still out there. So we're still, again, we're still striving. We're still out there. We're not going to uh, turn our backs on the community by no means. I come from Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago. I'm a product of the Chicago public schools also. I grew up in these neighborhoods, all these neighborhoods, were in, in Washington Park, where I was born and raised for a little bit, then in Pullman, where I was born and raised. I went to George and Recorders, so I'm a product of this. I've seen this from the bottom up, and from the outside and inside, and, and what have you. So those are the things we do, and, and, and I have experienced it also, the violence on a personal with my family, but also as a police officer. Mm -hmm. So reform, yeah, reform starts with you, with you all. Mm -hmm. so. so there are, and thank you for that, um, there are those that argue that reform is not going to solve this because um, as, as you were talking about, we're talking about foundational issues in society and certainly we have to deal with what's in front of us every day, but it is not going to, you know, at that point we're standing downstream plucking the fish out, they're being poisoned upstream. So. Um, there are those that argue that what we really need to be talking about at this point is abolishing. Abolishing ICE, abolishing police, abolish, abolishing incarceration. Um, and I'm wondering what you all think about 
I, and we'll start with you. I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. I, I, but yeah, but, right, I, I, but we, that's the extreme abolishing. We, we know that's not going to happen. Uh, we know you're never, never going to abolish the police. The police is needed in the community. That, that's no doubt. But it's, it, the police are needed in the right way. You know, and like I said, we're stressing constitutional policing within the Chicago Police Department now. But abolishing ICE, abolishing these other entities, I, I would think it just would be would help to create the charcoal that's out in the community now. We have to ha there have to be some parameters, and people have to know the parameters. You can't step out these parameters. You can't step out those parameters. Mm -hmm. There has to be law and order, you know. And but there doesn't have to be a military state that goes with it, <laughs> by no means. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, when it comes to something like abolish ICE, I actually do take that very literally. Um, I think, I mean, the, the argument there, right, is that Immigration and Customs Enforcement is an agency that's about, it's 2018, it's about like 15 years old, um, and that other agencies had, the, the responsibilities that ICE had were sort of devolved to other agencies and more accountability, and so well, I see that demand as actually like, quite literal, that it's, it's sort of conceivable to take this relatively young agency, uh, uh, revoke its charter, devolve its functions to other agencies and impose more accountability. Something like abolish police, uh, abolish prisons, I think there's an element of, of literalness to that, to that too, but I also think part of, part of those, uh, those ideas is sort of a challenge to what, I th what scholars would call carceral logics, right? That so much of American society is built on logics of a punishment, that if there is a problem, um, a, a perfect example is there, there's a problem of school shootings, and so the solution is to put cops in schools. Right. But, but do, do, you, do you want police in school? I mean, I mean do, you, do you want to expose children, and, and many of them vulnerable children, to the criminal justice system, regardless of how well-meaning the individual officer is, regardless of how well-meaning their superiors might be, you run, you run real risk when you begin exposing children to the criminal justice system at that young age, because some kids may get a slap on the wrist, some kids may end up um, uh, suspended in detention um, on paths that, that put them into the carceral system. And I think there really is something to, to the idea that we should look carefully for where logics of incarceration are kind of seeping into our thinking and into our, our problem solving. Um, it's sort of to, to build off something I said at the beginning, you can really think of the problem of mass incarceration as stemming from the imposition of logics of incarceration on problems that, that, that weren't carceral to begin with, right. problems of dislocation, problems of disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the information about the amount of money spent in these census tracts on, um, on sort of uh, criminal justice uh, prison, that stuff is sort of an illustration of the fact that there is a safety net for these communities. The safety net is like shoving people into the maw of, uh, of the prison system. Um, and so escaping that, when I, when I, the, the, I've spoken to people who think that it that who do think that like abolishing prisons is a conceivable thing. Their argument being that prisons as we know them are also a relatively recent intervention in like American public policy. And so there is a time before prisons and there can be a time after prisons. But even if you don't buy that, the underlying idea that you don't need to punish people to solve social problems. You don't need to um, uh, bring the force of the state against vulnerable, population, vulnerable populations to address the problems within those populations. I think it's a very powerful one and is worth absorbing um, and it's worth taking seriously. And Chicago is really at the heart of a lot of activists who are advocating for whether it's abolish ICE, abolish police, abolish prison for all the reasons that Jamel said. We, we have some information at our fingertips. Deputy Chief talked about the pressure that police felt in the 90s with crack. And the people in these neighborhoods were saying, we want more police. Mm -hmm. um, 
because it was an unknown, you didn't know. But I mean, the thing that I have learned as a resident and as a reporter is that police are not here to stop crime. We ask the police to do way too much mm -hmm. in solving the societal issues. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should learn from the 90s that the response to police and prisons for these things did not work. It left us in a, a bigger mess. And then we have the racialization of about who punishment should be for. So these activists who've been talking about healing and loving and assets were doing this before we started seeing these recent memes about Barbecue Becky and Permit Patty. <laughs> White people who feel like the police are their personal mm -hmm. direct line to call when they don't like black people doing something. Like there, I mean, that's that's the that's the carceral mentality that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You see some people in a park, like you think you have to call the police on them, right? Or just in and even mm -hmm. so, let's even take the racial part away. Um, you know, I used to live in Bronzeville. You know, a mixed. You know, there there was the, my my first month there. Somebody got killed across the street. So it's like, okay, well, you form a block club. Like, you get a phone tree line. I grew up in a, 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 a huge block club mentality. And if you see somebody doing something, you know, like I remember in our condo building, there was some kids sitting on the stoop. No, don't call the police on them. Please don't call the police. And I, get, like, and, and I also understand the idea, you don't know what someone's gonna do to you, you're scared, mm -hmm. but like, let's not be scared of our young people. Mm -hmm. Or I remember, I, we, we came a long way. My neighbor, somebody stole her barbecue pit. She went to one of the black guys and was like, yo, you need to get my barbecue. Like, can you find out who did that? Like, that was a much better way to handle that mm -hmm. than calling the police. So how we communicate with each other in neighborhoods I think is very important, whether it's you know an interracial dynamic or even interracial. Um, and then finally, I want to say, going back to like where Chicago is, um, John Burge mm. and reparations. There's no in there's no city in this country that has done what Chicago did. It seemed. Um, like John Burge, so uh, just a quick thumbnail, John Burge, white commander, oversaw torture of black men for 20 years. Had a nigger box, um, electrocuted, um, type, typewriter bags over people's heads, you know, all, all, I mean, there's, I encourage you to, to learn more and to, to read about it. Um, and it was a slow burn to get Burge fired, to get um, reparations. And so he's still getting his pension. He's still getting his pension. Mm. But you know, I, I will tell you this, the, the abolitionists don't want him in prison. After, he, he went to prison for lying under oath. And when that happened, there was this moment where they felt like there isn't any justice here. Okay, so he went to prison for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, what is the healing in the community? And so they pushed for reparations, and reparations was this comprehensive, because a lot of these men had already received multi-million dollar, dollar settlements. Reparations meant you and, your, you and your family get psychological counseling. It meant free tuition to city colleges. It meant a little bit of money, and it, and it also means that this chapter is being taught in Chicago public schools to all eighth graders and to all sophomores. Yeah. And so when you start looking at, they were looking at like, what can we do to heal? Like what, um, and, and these are the same people who even say, you know what, I don't want Bill Cosby to go to jail. Is jail gonna reform him? Because I mean, what was prison established for? Retri like, what, retribution and rehabilitation, and we know that rehab is not ha happening. Someone said, um, Bill Cosby should go to a black feminist therapist <laughs> <laughs> to work, you know, to work on his issues, on his and his money should be given to community-based organizations that do work around sexual violence, domestic. So it's it's this idea of imagination too. Yes, getting out of the carceral state. It's not saying, okay, well, you did something bad, you can just 
when, when people hear, and, you know, and I encourage you to follow Miriam Kaba on, on Twitter, um, the first person I ever heard use the, you know, her, uh, she's prison culture. Prison culture, yeah, um, prison culture. Miriam, M-A-R-I-A-M-E-K-A-B-A. -A -A. But read her work, I don't, that's not her Twitter name. Or, yeah, her Twitter, Twitter handle's prison, prison culture. culture. Yeah. Okay, terrific. But the, the, the whole idea is, because people always say, you just wanna let, you just wanna burn down the jails and let them all out. <laughs> um, and that's not what it is. It's about using your imagination. And I don't mean like creative, like, oh, let's have them, you know, build, like do free labor for this as opposed to that. <laughs> imagination means just thinking about how we want to deal with society mm -hmm. and, and these problems. It's not taking the key and letting murderers out. Although, I will say that if, as a society, we're serious about ending mass incarceration, it will require a conversation about what, what to do about violent criminals. Yeah. Like, yes. ending, yes. making a significant dent in reducing the prison population ultimately means taking people who have committed assault, who may have even committed murder, and saying that you actually have paid your debt to society and you don't need to be in prison for 15 years. Um, I think that's the right thing to do. But that's, I think that, that gets to this question of imagination. Like, it also seems like prison is hardening people. Like it's not doing the rehabilitation part. Right. You're going in, you know, whether it's low level or violent, and how are you right. coming out? You know, another book I would encourage to read about this is Danielle Allen's Cuz, C-U-Z. She used to be a professor at UFC but her cousin went to prison, and we, she writes about that. We brought her to oh, Roosevelt okay. for the last American Dream oh. Conference. Yeah, fabulous, yes. But as we talk about prison reform, and, and we talk about uh, abolishing police, we talk about abolishing, like you say, the prisons and, and ISIS and all that, but those things are, are not uh, realistic. What we could talk about is how, how do we rehabilitate those institutions, how do we reshape those institutions? Oh, and, okay. and what do we do? And, and that's where the conversation, like we're having here, that's where the conversation starts. Uh, again, you pointed out we can't just eliminate prisons because we do have violent offenders. Now, we do have low level, uh, nonviolent individuals in the prison system. That's one way of looking at it. How do we, where do we funnel them to? You know, these are the ones who come out, they're not the violent offenders and things like that, but people do, out in society, out in the streets, do say we still need those institutions, but we need to rehabilitate those institutions. And another thing, when you, when you talk about a dark history of the Chicago Police Department, yeah, John Burge was a dark history of the Chicago Police Department. Um, I came on, like I said, in, 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 the, in the late 80s, 85. I think John Burge was still here, but as a black police officer, we weren't allowed you know, it was still kind of segregated. We didn't deal with Burge and his crew or anything like that. They were in the detective division. Just so happened, maybe two or three or four years later, I ended up taking over in that particular spot where Burge had in Area 2. So we had moved a great deal past that. We still have to deal with that in our history, in Chicago's history. Chicago police has a heck of a history that we still have to deal with. But the face of the police department, the diversity of the police department, the changing of the command staff, which the Superintendent Johnson has really mixed up and has really ele elevated more minorities in the command staff. So those things are a part of changing the Chicago police culture now. And again, we are up under the consent decree and, and we are changing the way we do things and even the use of force and using force and how we use deadly force. We're changing all of that. We're under reform and it's mandatory change. We're all getting that training and it's gonna be training that's gonna be going on for the next few years now. Even with the young recruits that we have, we have 100 recruits who come out every month now. They're getting that training. Those recruits that are coming out now wasn't on the police department during the Burge era and, and those things, so they're coming on 
you know, fresh and start. They're coming on with a whole different strategy now. They're coming on with a whole different mentality and how they're going to interact in, from this day and moving forward. Because they are, they're going to be the present. They're going to be the future of this police department. So, you know, the superintendent and the staff are, are putting things in place where we can hopefully ensure that we never get back to a John Birch type of a, a police department. Another thing is when we, when we start talking about police in schools, uh, when I grew up uh, uh, a while ago, we, we had officer friendlies in the school. Mm. So there were some police where you enjoyed seeing the police. Police were coming to coloring books. You color, you get your books. And then um, another thing is, yep, yeah, in this society and today, uh, the school, the children feel comfortable now having police in school. Police are interactive in the school. Yeah, we're there for safety reasons, but the children are there in the grammar schools, in the high school. Uh, part-time, I, I, I dealt, dealt with the schools. I uh, was the police in the school doing part-time work. Matter of fact, I even substituted in, in the Chicago public schools. And the kids get to know you, they get to know the officer, they get to know you, the individual. So having the police in the school, I don't think it, it, it's going to be detrimental. I think it, it's going to be a good thing because of the way we are going now and what have you. So those type of reforms, those type of things that we're putting in place in the police department for the future of the Chicago Police Department and the community here in Chicago. I went to CPS and I had metal detectors and I had police in schools. And I can't believe I'm about to quote Cardi B. <laughs> <laughs> but she put on Instagram, like the problem is y'all don't have police in the white schools where the shootings happen. <laughs> Why y'all got metal detectors in the black and Latino schools? Yep. Yep. But that also, I mean, I just dealt with it because I actually didn't know another normal. I thought that was normal mm -hmm. to go through mm -hmm. a metal detector every day. That's not normal. Mm -hmm. well, well, like and to have police, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, I don't think that's a normal thing well, that like kids said, should have to go through. No, it's, it's not normal. It shouldn't be what you should have to go through those metal detectors. But like you say, growing up in Chicago, in the communities that we grew up in, in certain communities, in those schools, you, you had to have that. Now, being a police but did officer. We, did we well, have to have Well, being a police officer in, in Chicago for all the years that I have been, I've gotten guns out of school. I've gotten guns off of kids in school. So, it, and, and just the violent component of it. I think it makes the children feel a little safer because police are human too, and they get to know the human side of policing and what have you. Now, every school doesn't have uh, metal detectors. Every public school doesn't have metal detectors. Some do, and that's the principal's choice of that particular school. So, so I'm going to intervene here. <laughs> um, and I'm, I am happy to hear that this is on the radar in the police department, yes, because I remember a few years back when the state's attorney yeah. had to tell CBD to stop arresting children in school. So I'm yeah, well, really yeah. happy to hear that this yeah. switch is happening. Um, what I, I want to give you all a chance to be able to talk with this amazing panel and ask your questions. Whoever asked about how long can your comment be, please keep the mic away from that person. <laughs> <laughs> this is a not subtle question. Given that there used to be a, an organization, the Afro-American Police League, with people like Renault Robinson, Howard Saffold, and Pat Hill, who did understand how to relate to the community, I want to know, and this is to you, Deputy Chief, I want to know, when is the Chicago Police Department going to stop acting like an occupying army okay. in the, exactly the communities Natalie mentioned so that we don't have killings of barbers in South Shore by what was clearly an occupying army? Well, we, 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 those are, it's not, not so much that, that, that we are uh, a, a military or occupying force in the community as it is so much as people want police out in the community, in certain communities where violence are taking place. We have to address their needs and their concerns, and then they call, and we put police out there in those particular communities. So, and the police are not there as an occupying force. If, if you go out there, the police do engage in the community that come around. I'll try to make this very important. After over 50 years of therapy, I've learned to love myself for the first time, most of it incompetent. Steve Allen had a program called Meeting of Minds with people living in different places being together. We could learn from each other, the nations around the world. Why did that young man have to be shot 16 times? Was he from kryptonite or something? OJ did it. 
He wasn't able to kill a totally defenseless woman and a man under cover of darkness without a weapon. Our legal system is a game. It's ridiculous. Maybe they didn't know this entry in the Guinness Book of World Records. A woman picked up the end of a 4,000 pound car. It fell on her son, her jack broke. She weighed 125 pounds. In her case, it was motivation, but also adrenaline. In the case of Mr. Simpson, psychotic fury. But also, I saw a t-shirt in the Museum of Science and Industry. I like to read t-shirts, bumper stickers, et cetera, it said, he's translated, you don't appreciate something till you lose it. I appreciated my mother and father more after they passed. Maybe I should have a t-shirt, misunderstood and mistreated genius. Not IQ, judgment, logic, rationality. I'm almost done. I'm kicked out of the Skokie Public Library for a month because I helped a child walk down the stairs. I helped a child walk down the stairs. I've never had a broken bone. I've never had a broken bone. So why do you think of, oh, if I get arrested, I say, keep your phones on. Don't let me keep you from an important call. And also, it would be comments as well as questions and answers. So why do you think of, please look on YouTube for Super Dave Osborne. He did stunts that the evil, the evil didn't do. They don't always turn out well. And also, Ted Savage, don't forget him. He was Lurch and the Adams family and the hand. And I do. I got a real question, so. Um, we need to move to the next question. <laughs> like, are y'all just gonna let that do ramble on? Like, can I, can I just say to the man with the microphone right now, I think that you put a lot of effort into this and I really would be happy to see it. And if you emailed it to me, I'm also happy to put it out there. It's just, we only have 25 minutes for everybody to participate. So that's, I don't wanna shut you down. But I, I want to make sure. Oh, Lord. OK, we don't need all that. Healing, all right, everyone. So next, <laughs> next question. Anyways, hello, panel. Um, Deputy Commander, um, I don't, you know, as a young black man in Chicago, I don't like the way you talk. Like, listening to you talk about the crack era. Looking to you talk about, listening to you talk about the crack era, I feel like you haven't learned any lessons because you talk about these people, you know, individuals as like a contagion. And I feel like nothing has really. <laughs> I feel. I'm in total control. Thank you for your patience. Would you mind starting from the beginning? Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I was like, yeah. I mean, I was saying that um, I feel like, as a young black person, like I didn't like the way you talked about the crack era and mm -hmm. the insensitivity that the way you talked about it. I don't feel like you've learned any lessons about it because when you talk about individuals and and people, those are predominantly young black men, and they are people, mm -hmm. and there's not much difference between like me and you and then we've, we've had different circumstances and it's kind of like really strange to hear you defend ICE because I know that ICE is going through communities, there are children here in, in Chicago being held and y'all don't want to waste your time arrest, sending children to, <laughs> to, to be held in, uh, in beds here. And I just want to know like, I, I don't ever feel like the police learn anything and I don't, you just carte blank defended kind of everything I saw that to say and defending police in schools and police are human too. I mean, yeah, but you, yeah. you still kill people. Like the, their metal detector, like I had metal detectors in, in Walter Hayden <laughs> and I just, yeah, yeah. Like I'd like to know what you have to say and what Jamel and uh, about what, what can we really do to change the mindset? Cause when I hear you talk, I don't, I don't feel any change. I don't feel you get it. Well, first, the, first, the Chicago Police Department, we don't really deal with ICE. We can't make an arrest for ICE. We don't do nothing for ICE like that. We don't call ICE to do anything. So that part of, of ICE, we don't deal with ICE like that. Secondly, when you talk about the drug academic, that was just a quick history 
of the drug academic and its impact on the black community coming forth and moving forward. And my perspective as a police, I grew up in Chicago also. I have uh, young ne nephews and, 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 and kids who grew up in Chicago too. So it's not no disrespect to you or anyone if you took it that way. I'm sorry you took it that way. It wasn't meant to be taken that way. But I'm a, I am a police officer, black police officer. So I understand the dynamics, the consequences of all of that. I've seen it on both sides. So I, I'm sorry you took it that way. I'm, and. Uh, I'm just sorry you took it that way. If you pull out a notepad with previous writings on it, I'm going to stop you. No, it's only the program. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I graduated from Roosevelt in 1968, became an inner city teacher for three years. And my lottery number for the Vietnam War draft came up to 290, so I began law school. And then I practiced in the area of criminal law for 45 years. And my experience, and I think it's something you did not address, is that almost all my clients had messed up families. And for instance, the attraction to gangs wasn't drugs, wasn't uh, a power, it was somebody acknowledging them because their family life was messed up, the projects, and by the way, racism and segregation have a lot to do with this. Mm -hmm. But the point is, why can't we get more programs to embrace these young people from the beginning so they don't just get one meal a day and so on and so forth, and so that they believe there's somebody that cares for them? Mm -hmm. Was that a statement or did you have a question? <laughs> Thank you. I mean, we, we can establish programs. I mean, that's, that's actually like really easy. It's, it's more that just the, there isn't the political will to do it, right? That like, that, 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 that requires, that requires, um, yeah, that's. I mean, that's that. That's there's a, there's a long there's a long complicated answer about sort of like you know post '60s American politics. But like the short answer is that there just hasn't there's just not the political will for that kind of massive investment, and especially not in the kinds of communities that are typically written off as essentially sort of um, uh, worthless. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I I just wanted to kind of go back to the initial point, mass incarceration. And um, I think people need to understand that mass incar incarceration is not a new phenomena. If you remember history, right after slavery, mass incarceration was utilized with convict leasing programs to build the railroads, to dig uh, levees, to do whatever. It was an economic engine that was uh, utilized a lot in the South. And laws were made up to have simple infractions make you get a 10-year prison uh, term, and then you would be farmed out to do the work and make the money for the state of Mississippi, the state of Alabama, et cetera, et cetera. And these were black convicts, okay? That's number one. Number two, I'd like to also indicate that we do live in the land of Al Capone. And what I mean by that is Chicago's legacy in history as far as gang violence, shoot 'em ups drive-bys, whatever, it's a long history. It's not just the 60s, the 70s. It's the 20s, it's the 30s. The, the ethnicity of some of the people doing this stuff may have changed, but the phenomena has always been there. And finally, for the Chicago police, there's a long history of bad behavior by the Chicago police. I mean, if you're beating up steel workers in the 30s, if you're beating up uh, the convention people in 68, I mean, whatever, there has been that legacy that we sometimes lose sight of. Any employee that works for anybody 
should be able to be disciplined, okay? I'm not against police. I'm against bad police. And when you go to work every day, no matter where you go and who you work for, you know the bad employee. You know the person that's not the good worker. So all I'm saying is supervision, supervision should be able to handle the problem that we have with the systemic problem police officer who goes on and on and on with major infractions, multiple infractions, never ever serves any penalty. Can I, can I just make a quick comment? Yes, please. Just to, to, to respectfully disagree a little bit about the convict leasing point. Um, convict leasing was a thing, it did emerge sort of in the, in the post-reconstruction South. Um, but I think it's important not to, um, not to like the, the number of African-American men predominantly caught up in convict leasing, um, probably like the best estimates is it didn't really ever crack 100,000. And there's about 5.5 5, 5, 5, 5 million blacks in the South. And so it's, it's a pretty small percentage of the overall black population. What makes mass incarceration distinct um, even though it has important antecedents in American history, is that it is a phenomenon that touches a large percentage of African-American men. Um, a Harvard sociologist, Bruce Western, in a book called Crime and Punishment in America, makes a very important point that the prison system for African-American men acts sort of a reverse version of the military. If the military is an institution that takes in people and essentially makes them better citizens, gives them training, gives them skills, gives them, puts them sort of on a respectable path through American society, prison does precisely the opposite for people in it in. And, and, and for a, a substantial chunk of African American men, prison is this sort of devolving institution that, that essentially alienates them from the mainstream of American life. And that is the thing that is very new. Like that did not exist at that scale in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, in the mid 20th century, it very much is a product of um, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And so I, I, I think, I think your, your, your broad point that there are, there are things like mass incarceration in American history is right. But I think it's important not to, um, not to uh, sort of underplay the extent to which our current phenomena is something truly unique. Um, both in American history and kind of in, in global history. There isn't really anything like it. Um, and that's what makes it so disturbing. And I just want to add, too, to that. Um, yeah, Chicago has been historically more violent than New York and Los Angeles going back 100 years. In the 1920s, the Chicago Tribune had a murder hand clock on the front page. That's what we see, the weekend roundups. Yeah. today. So this is huh. the difference in, I recommend Khalil Gibran Muhammad's book, The Condemnation of Blackness. Great book. It's, again, the racialization of crime. Back then, young white, eth white ethnic men would get off of work, and there'd be murders in bars all the time. Mm -hmm. So it was seen as a societal problem. And that's when you had your Jane Addams, your social workers see this as we have to fix this. Black crime has always been seen as black on black crime. Black people go fix your neighborhoods. We're not going to put programs in because black people just get your shit together. Yeah. It's a black problem and not a societal problem. Yes. Oh. Yes. Um, good evening. I, I want to really kind of address what this young lady said and also what you said. Um, my question and I guess kind of combined comment is with regards to mass incarceration and what do you say to people who feel like it's the new slavery? According to Michelle Alexander and her book, The Jim Crow, she's saying that you know, African-American neighborhoods are more policed than white neighborhoods, so we know that there isn't more crime. And with mass incarceration, it is the new slavery because it's legalized slavery where you're over-policing African-American neighborhoods that face chronic poverty, institutionalized and structural racism, racial isolation, food deserts, and then you come in and you police them. And 
you know, Angela Davis talks about our prisons obsolete, should we abolish them? Not necessarily, but we're learning that most of the people that are incarcerated are for minor infractions. They're not necessarily for violent crimes or things of that nature. So what can we really do to move the needle for young people or people like myself that are concerned about mass incarceration that go and get their degree? I graduated from Roosevelt University with honors, but as an African-American female, I face institutional and structural racism on a daily basis. And so what do we do to move the conversation forward? but also to sort of metamorphosize our laws so that we're not continually coming up against this wall. Because you have some judges who have to hand out mandatory sentences. There was something in the news, and forgive me for not knowing the young lady's name, the recidivism rate is high, so once you, you get out of prison, you can't get a job, you can't get a license, you can't get funding for um, federal programs, you can't get grants. It's legalized slavery, and it is a way of rolling back the civil rights movement. And I think that Segregation does play a part in it because we have neighborhoods that you mentioned that are 99% African American versus some of the neighborhoods like Deerfield who may be 100% white. So yes, there is segregation, but if you're living in chronic poverty and you don't have upward mobility, how are you going to get yourself out of that situation? It's like taking a person <clears throat> blame approach to a system blame problem. So what can we really do besides having a conversation to really give people hope and something tangible that they can move the needle forward? Woo! <laughs> and I turn it over to you all. <laughs> um, I really, I, I really, uh, I really dislike being um, the I hate to push back a little bit person, um, but I would. I so Michelle Alexander's book is great, and I think the power of the new Jim Crow, um, the 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 power of that analogy of that metaphor is that it's trying to communicate the extent to which the, um, the, the, how mass incarceration envelopes entire communities and sort of sets them apart in a caste relationship, in a pariahship relationship, not unlike Jim Crow. I think it's a really powerful and important metaphor, and I think it's very useful. Um, I also think it's important to maintain distinctions. Distinctions may end up being slim, they may end up being small, but they still matter, right? And so mass incarceration may have some similarities to Jim Crow. You may be able to make a useful analogy to Jim Crow, but it, but it isn't Jim Crow in some pretty fundamental ways. Um, you may be able to find and draw similarities between um, uh, uh, shadow slavery and mass incarceration um, there, may, there are definite continuities between the, between the things. There are theoretical connections to make. But on a fun, on, on also it is true that shadow slavery is, is a, a crime and evil, an order of magnitude worse than mass incarceration. And I think it's important for respecting the, the weight of that history to not sort of draw like a one-to-one -one, one -one analogy between them. Um, it's not to say that uh, there's no use in trying to draw out the connections between the institutions, the connections between the social relations revealed um, over time. But I, 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 this is this is just sort of me as like a, a professional writer and a person who, who thinks a lot about these things. I, I do think it's important to to maintain distinctions and to uh, to respect distinctions where they exist. And I think there are important distinctions between all of these things. I'm not an activist, I'm a journalist, but I'm often asked, what can I do? And I feel like sometimes people are, are waiting for this one nugget of an answer that's going to dismantle white supremacy. <laughs> and that's not there. So I tell people that everything starts local, like really on your neighborhood, your block level. You know, whether it's your neighborhood school that's under research, like, I, I don't know what neighborhood you live in or any of the other people, and if it's not your neighborhood, the neighborhood next over, but these issues, because we're talking about the, the, the foundational issues, so it really starts with, well, who's blocking affordable housing in your neighborhood? What's going on in this under-resourced school? This, you know, like, what, whatever is, is going on there, that's where I would start. And then there's the institutional level where there are tons of advocacy groups that are doing the work. Um, and if we're looking at mass incarceration and returning citizens, 
that that group would be the safer foundation. And then how do you I mean there they have policy people they're looking at what type of legislation should get passed because these are state issues. And the one thing that I that I wanted to say that I didn't get a chance to is when we look at these numbers of incarceration, we also have to look at the connection between, yes, the Austins, but also that small Illinois rural town that has the prison. Yeah. And the jobs that are there. This is a jobs issue that mirrors each other. It's a representation issue. Yeah. There, are, there are plenty of states where um, uh, a prison is in a rural county, and the rural county gets representation in voting. the legislature for the population of that prison, even though those people cannot vote. And so it ends up being kind of a backdoor way of disenfranchising a lot of people, and then weighting the votes of people who have a direct economic benefit in the presence of a prison. And I, I would finally say, I, I think that there's this focus on, as there's, you know, national politics, president, and then there's the mayor. You gotta pay attention to state politics and where that, the allocations, the budget, like there's a lot of stuff that's happening in Springfield that affects our cities, that affects every, that just affects everything. And I would, I would say start paying attention to that. Uh, from, just from the, the law enforcement perspective, it's specifically the Chicago Police Department, we have what we call the gang violence reduction strategy. Part of that gang violence reduction strategy is what we call the call-in uh, situations that we do have. It's a call-in where we identify certain individuals in the community who we think, are, who we suspect are driving the violence because of their history, their engagement, and they continue to be active. But what we do, we have call-in. And if they're on probation or parole, it's a mandatory that they come to these call-ins. When you get to the call-ins, we have city services, social organizations, and, we, and uh, other entities, and we offer them the opportunity to get out of the gangs, to stop the violence, and, and we make the, them these, we give them these opportunities to do that, to come to us, and, and, and just to get away from it. There are other entity, social organizations that we have where they can come and get jobs, they will refer to jobs if they want. We can't make them, but we, by them being on probation or parole, they are they already identified. We can't make them do it, but we offer it to them, but we let them know also that if the violence continue, that we will deal with them. But we do offer them a way out. We do give them a way out, social services, all the city services that we have, getting a job, come and talk to us. It's, it's not happening. We do this on a continuous basis in the Chicago Police Department. So we are out there trying doing our due diligence to break this down from another aspect outside of, of locking them up uh, and just enforcing the law on them. So we have enough time for two minutes for the whole show for the question and the response. You can go fast. Well, let me just say this. Let me let me say this. That is. Let, let me just say this. That is not the. That is not us. That's the railroad police. They'd be putting them trucks out there. They might call for assistance from Chicago. I'd like to say the soup say he's going to invest, but that's not us putting those trucks out there. Not the Chicago police putting those trucks out there. That's a whole different entity, so that's another law enforcement entity. Okay, um, I think this is where we need to end it just because of the time. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to this amazing panel. Really appreciate this discussion. Enjoy your evening, and I hope that you've got your American Dream Conference
other events lined up, which are going to be coming to. I'll see you there. Yeah. Just a reminder, tomorrow um, we have Rebecca Tracer, uh, Maudlin Hegerica talking about the Me Too movement, and then Eric Holder, former Attorney General of the United States, um, speaking in the Auditorium Theater at 7 o'clock. Please join us for both of those events. Thank you all.